Well, I figured with all the changes going on behind the bench and in the front office of a few NHL teams, it was time to come on and talk about them a little bit. Some of the moves came as a bit of a surprise. Some of them could have been predicted probably even earlier on than they actually happened. And some of them just plain made sense. So let's take a quick look at some of the changes and what it means for their teams. In Montreal, Jeff Gorton was hired to be their chief executive for hockey. And subsequently, Scott Mellenby resigned and Mark Bergevin was let go. It's strongly believed outside of the organization that Mark Bergevin would not have been returning anyway, that he was going to allow his contract to expire and either just take some time off or explore something else with another team. It was also believed that Bergevin was putting the name of Scott Mellenby forward as his possible successor. And when it became clear that that wasn't going to happen, Mellenby decided that he'd rather leave as well. When the Habs brought in Gorton as their chief of hockey ops, it was decided that with Bergevin likely leaving and the two sides not being able to agree to some type of an extension, that it was time to just let him go and start the process of moving forward. During this season, Bergevin had become a particular lightning rod for the fan base. I really don't know that I agree. I I think Bergevin generally had done a good job. Sure, not every move works out, but when you look at the type of roster he was able to build and the pieces he's brought in over the years and his ability to move out the pieces that were needed, I I think overall he's been a fine GM. And and I was a little bit surprised that something wasn't done to work out some type of an extension with him. When you take a look at the roster this year and considering it's missing Carey Price and Shea Weber, no one should be surprised that there have been struggles. And I think that's my thinking on Bergevin. I I don't know that he had anything in particular to do with those two players not playing this season. Moving from East Coast to West, the Vancouver Canucks got rid of Jim Benning as their GM and most of his staff. They also fired head coach Travis Green, who they had just signed to a contract extension last year. They brought in Jim Rutherford. He's a veteran as an interim GM and also veteran coach Boos Brujo to fill Green's role. This is something I've talked about on a couple different videos. This is my biggest thing with the Vancouver Canucks. Whether or not it was solely Jim Benning's decision, whether or not he was just taking orders from the Aquilinis, they've been spinning their tires probably the last five or six seasons, bringing in guys that weren't really that good, giving them a little bit too much money, signing them a little bit too long, and they end up with their contract problems. Then they replace those soon-to-be expiring contracts with another huge contract. It's They just sort of can't get out of their own way. I think it's really clear that the organization really just needs to find its direction and stick with it. I don't know whether interim GM Jim Rutherford is going to stick around long-term. He may move up into a more advisory role when a long-term GM is found. But hard decisions are going to have to be made on some of the players on this roster. And we're going to need to see some decision making on what direction the team is going to go. Alain Vigneault, gone from Philadelphia, replaced by everyone's favorite interim short-term fill-in coach, Mike Yo. It's been two seasons now of struggles for the Philadelphia Flyers. And I'm not really sure Vigno ever really completely fit in with the team, with the players, with the organization. Although he is a good coach, he's been around for quite a while. It's difficult to see what exactly went wrong and where all the disconnects were. Was it with the younger players? Was it with the veteran players? Did they just have a terrible season of goaltending last year and not quite enough left in the tank to recover this year? We'll see what happens now that Yo's behind the bench. Uh, As I described him, he's the consummate interim coach. He seems to be like the guy, if you can't find someone who you really want or really need or just got to go out and get, hey, uh, call Mike Yo, see what he's doing. All right. There were also a couple of suspensions from a spicy game between the Winnipeg Jets and the Toronto Maple Leafs. Neil Pionk took a run at Rasmus Sandin, stuck his knee out and... um, Yeah, he did some damage. Sandine's going to be out a little bit. And I guess most of the Leafs were a little bit ticked off because they tried going after him. And who was the guy who decided to step up to the plate? Old man Spezza. Spezza in recent years has turned himself into a bit of a heart and soul player. The sort of willing to do what it takes, 
dropping the gloves in a playoff game, spurring on his team to a three goal comeback. Um, Spets has just really changed the way people see him as a player from the, the guy who was drafted second overall, the highly skilled playmaker with the sneaky shot. Um, I think more than anyone, he's really transformed himself that I can think of uh, from the from the playmaker to the wily veteran. Spezza took a pretty healthy run at Pionk, and along the way, Pionk sort of fell. Spezza still wanted to get a piece of him, so he leaned in pretty hard, and eventually Pionk ended up about knee level, and that's where Spezza kind of went for it. I mean, really, obviously not a smart play. I know what Jason was doing there. And sometimes when you're still just trying to get a piece of a guy, you just put a part of your body on his and it happened to be knee to the chest or chin or face or head, whatever it was that everybody saw. But I think we all know uh, probably really wasn't the right move to make. Spezza is appealing, but he did get a six game suspension from the Department of Player Safety. Um, I thought it was maybe one or two games high. The guy who's never been suspended in his career but it was a pretty egregious foul. There's really not a lot of ways to explain yourself out of that one. I know they did determine that he was a hittable player at the time. And other than the fact that he fell, he would have been hit cleanly, but even still you need a guy in the head and you give him a concussion. You can kind of expect that you're going to get something. Pionk got a two game suspension for his hit on Sandine. And that's the one I really didn't agree with. I think Pionk deserved far more. He wasn't even penalized on the play. It should have been a five in a game easily, as far as I can tell. This is one of those dirty, dirty plays, targeting a player, sticking out your knee, and it's intent to injure. Even if there would have been a penalty called on the play, let's say they give him five in a game. Pionk's now out of there, and it diffuses the situation that led to the Spezza hit. The whole game would have taken on a different tone, in my opinion, and we wouldn't have seen the antics of some of the Jets players that we did who were, I guess, just happy to not get beat up by Wayne Simmons. And just when we thought it was safe to skate around with our heads down, Jacob Truba enters the chat. Truba absolutely obliterated Jujar Kyra. He left him laying flat on his back, staring up at the ceiling, completely out cold. It was a big hit. It was a punishing hit. It was a fairly clean hit by my estimation. Kyra, if you see, gets a pass and starts looking down just as Truba is coming towards him. And other than the fact that his head was down, I, I think Truba really is about to hit a guy really clean and really hard. And uh, it's an unfortunate outcome, but I really didn't have that much of a problem with it. It's difficult. Once you've decided to hit a guy, you've lined him up, you're in the process of delivering a check. It's really hard if the guy moves a certain way for you to also move to limit the contact in one place or another without possibly hurting him somewhere else or even causing an injury to yourself. For the people who are questioning Truba's motives or whether or not he should have followed through with the hit like he did on Kyra, I just want to know what would you have done different in that moment at that speed while delivering a hit? How would you have changed the outcome? Are you just going to get out of the way? Are you going to bail? Are you going to lower your head down so that you're hitting him in the chest and then your head smashed together? I don't want to get too hot takey on this one. I think it was a series of events that led to a bad outcome. All right, so how are we going to explain the McKinnon hit in his very next game? Well, that was a nasty one too. Uh, I think this one was a little worse than the Kyra hit. I think the Kyra hit, again, was... Uh, series of unfortunate events so what we see on this play is nathan mckinnon a right hand shot curling around the top of the circle he's reaching for the puck and then tries the stick handle because there's another couple rangers there but we all know the new york rangers defense is really easy to stick handle through nate grabs it goes forehand backhand turns toward the net and there's trubo waiting for him you can see trubo in the replay he's eyeing the player he knows who the puck carrier is he knows he's a dangerous player and then he steps up and plants his shoulder right in McKinnon's chest. I don't think that hit was really all that bad. And for all this talk about guys throwing hits and following through, you kind of have to do that or you're going to fall over. It's called balance. 
Also, your shoulder is above where your arm is. So if you're pushing it forward, it swings on a plane. So it has to go up towards the shoulder. Same question as I asked with the Kyra hit. What would you have actually done differently? I know you can say, oh, I wish I would have done something differently. But in that moment, at that speed, with one of the NHL's best players coming down towards your goalie, what are you going to do? I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to do exactly what Truba did. You're going to have a look, see the player, find where he's going. You're going to put yourself between the player and the net. You're going to knock him on his behind. Same thing. Let's not get all hot takey about this. But really, when it comes down to it, it's a guy throwing a clean check that's just hard. Hey, last but not least, let's give Marc-Andre Fleury a big congratulations on his 500th win in the NHL. I think it was pretty interesting that he was able to accomplish this in Montreal. That's actually the place I think Marc-Andre Fleury is going next. Who knows? Maybe he gets traded somewhere at the deadline. But for next season, I have a feeling Marc-Andre Fleury is going to be the starting goalie for the Montreal Canadiens. When we look at last season's Stanley Cup final appearance, followed up by the Seattle Kraken expansion draft fiasco, and his current timeout not being with the team, I have a feeling Carey Price may have played his last or is about to play his last few games for the Montreal Canadiens. And why wouldn't you think Marc-Andre Fleury would be a good candidate to replace him? Fleury, clearly a great goalie, won the Vesna Trophy last year. Not playing quite as well this year, but he's on a team that stinks, so what are you going to do? If Price was moved, the Canadians may end up retaining some salary, but I don't think Fleury is going to command the type of dollars he once did. I, I could see him taking a lower dollar contract to come home, so to speak, if he actually wants to play for the Blue Blanc et Rouge. So I think it'll be interesting to see what happens. Uh, I think it'd be a nice way for him to end his career. And who knows, with Montreal, they have a good team. They have a decent roster. They just kind of need to get things in order. They need to add a couple of pieces. And Fleury at least would be a stabilizing force uh, in the back end. And you'd free up a lot of that cap space you'd relieve with Price leaving. And you'd be able to bring in the types of pieces that you need to get that team back on track. All right, everybody, thanks for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.